My father came from South India and married my mother who was born in Penang. Uh, my brother uh, Gerard, he had the ability to teach himself how to play the piano. Uh, then there was Jeffrey who was to sing. Uh, he had a very nice, very, very fine voice, still has. Uh, so the whole family grew up in a musical environment and we sort of naturally uh, pick, picked all this up. We didn't really have to learn very, very much, we didn't have to have formal lessons until later when my father felt we needed to be trained properly. Uh, being taught my own father was always a casual business. And I, I never really took it seriously, I used to enjoy the lessons. But uh, when he sent me to a, a violin teacher for, for formal violin lessons, that was when I, I really felt the, 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 the urge and felt the inspiration of being taught properly. And that's when I wanted to, to study the violin seriously. Oh, Chi Kogtat was most patient and excellent. And he used to teach not merely by telling, but by doing it himself. And he always had a violin with him when he taught. And that was great because uh, uh, you could see what he was doing and you could hear what he was doing. And it was easy to, to, to follow, follow his instructions. Uh, Mr. Williams was a very talented uh, musician from Wales, a graduate in music, and uh, he came out uh, with a passion to pass on as many of his skills as he could to as many people in, involved in Singapore's students as well as teachers. Uh, he started off with uh, teachers' choirs, uh, which I joined, and then of course uh, he gave conducting lessons to a few of us uh, whom he thought uh, would benefit from such lessons. It was a most interesting period and one that was most helpful in helping me to build up my own skills uh, as, a, as a young conductor at that time. Uh, the Japanese uh, were very musical people <coughs> and one of the things they did, of course, most of their efforts were were, were geared towards the entertainment for their own troops. But the public in Singapore also had a chance to listen to their music. They established an orchestra which was known as the Shodan Hokkaido Orchestra, uh, which, which was centered in the Victoria Theatre. My involvement at this time uh, was twofold. First of all, it was a question of survival. Uh, it gave me a chance to, to, to continue playing the violin and it gave me a chance to become uh, closely associated with some good violinists, people like Mr. Dissa, people like Mr. Baksafra, who, who were then uh, among the leading musicians here in Singapore. It was a small group of people, everyone knew it, they knew each other, and uh, quite a few of the musicians knew that apart from playing the violin, I, I used to conduct school choirs and so on and um, uh, one day when the conductor was not available the person who normally takes over would be Ferry Krempel who was the number two man a Hungarian uh, musician who was very very good uh, he too was sick so <laughs> the, the, the main work for that afternoon uh, was Haydn's Surprise Symphony uh, and someone told, told them the manager of the orchestra, uh, that fellow meeting me, uh, can do some conducting, why don't you ask him? At that time conducting meant somebody standing up in front of the orchestra and waving his arms and starting the orchestra and stopping it. And uh, I had to work very, very hard uh, during that week to study uh, that score. And it was uh, something like baptism of fire. I got pushed into the thing uh, by this fact that these two people, the usual conductor and Ferry Krapel were also not available. And that pushed me into the, into the role of conductor of this orchestra. It was uh, a most frightening uh, experience, but it was something that, that later on I very much enjoyed, having the experience of conducting this live orchestra. 
this was uh, a very propitious thing that happened <coughs> to, to me and my family. This gave me a chance to study uh, music properly, apart from what I had learned in Singapore from the teachers available here. And it gave me a chance to study singing. Uh, strangely, there were no singing teachers here at all. And I used to be very keen on singing. I had sang a lot of tenor in those days. And I wanted singing lessons as well as conducting lessons. And this scholarship in 1947 came as a very, very wonderful uh, opportunity. Uh, it gave me an opportunity to meet uh, professors of singing and conducting. Uh, and the lessons were, 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 were so inspiring. And it, uh, I was uh, very young at that time, hardly 30, and I was full of energy. And uh, I was able to borrow from the British Council a gramophone, one of those wind-up things, you know, uh, and records. So I borrowed the records of the music that was being taught uh, in the college. It was a re very rewarding, rewarding time, and the lessons I had in singing as well as conducting uh, were things that I never dreamed of having, which at the time, at that time, there was no, nobody else had ever been to, to Europe to study music from Singapore at all at that time. And it was a great experience and something that provided me with the opportunities that happened later. The factors that led me to form the Singapore Chamber Ensemble, uh, yes, uh, mainly there were uh, two factors. One was the pra practical, practically uh, non-existent non-existence of any music making in Singapore. Uh, nothing was happening, there was a complete void. And secondly, of course, the fact that I had come, come back from London uh, full of <laughs> passion for this kind of thing, wanting to, wanting to enjoy choral music and orchestral music. And I realized that the only way I could do it was to form my own groups, because there were no existing groups that I could, I could join or take over. Uh, so I formed my own group. The rehearsals were most enjoyable because we used to, we used to work for about uh, an hour and a half or so uh, after listening to the records and then we would have a break for refreshments and then we would have another hour, hour and a half or so. So a typical program would be uh, 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 an orchestral first half, an overture, uh, usually mainly string work or if not something which included just just a couple of woodwinds and, and horns, uh, and then a, a concerto grosso or, or a Berenberg concerto, and then, then, then we would probably have a soloist, a violinist or a pianist, and that would end the first half. The second half was usually devoted to, to the choir, uh, being accompanied by the, by the orchestra, by the strings. And the choir usually sang uh, cantatas from Bach. We started off mainly with that. And then, of course, uh, some of the works by Haydn and, and Mozart and so on. And uh, the, the typical concert was always like that. Uh, later on, we, we embarked on more, more, difficult, more difficult things like Elgar's Music Makers and uh, Handel's uh, uh, Aces and Galatea, things like, of that kind, which came much later. This was a great occasion for Singapore. The first time that ever uh, such a festival was held. In fact, in, in my book, I have referred to it as the mother of all festivals. Uh, this included participation in music and dance, and also it included an exhibition of musical instruments, an exhibition of uh, dance costumes and so on, from the various countries of the region. Uh, including uh, South Korea, Hong Kong, India, uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, Thailand. All these countries participated. It was, it was a great time of getting together of artists of the region. The objectives of this center was to try and provide some kind of aesthetic rounding off uh, to our graduating students it was felt by the vice chancellor at that time that before they actually left the university, uh, these graduating students should have some kind of 
rounding off uh, towards their aesthetic education. And so the Center for Musical Activities was started. Well, I had been a teacher all my life, and, had, and all my life I had been associated with young people, and I had no trouble at all uh, relating uh, to the uh, undergraduates, many of whom were not, were not as young as school children, and many of whom were quite different from school children. In fact, uh, they, they, were, they, they were wanting to be, uh, to, be, uh, to, to be tutored and so on. Very often we went way beyond the, the two hours set aside for the rehearsal. Sometimes we spent three hours, four hours rehearsing works just because we, we, we were interested in it and nobody, nobody walked out on, on that. Well, this was a great honor because I was now being recognized by, by our old country, our old government, and uh, this was the highest award I could get. Uh, of course, I was very honored to receive it, and this was uh, a great thing for me. Uh, I, I felt that, uh, that all my work all, the, all over the years uh, had been recognized, but this wasn't going to stop me from <laughs> carrying on, which I did. Well, the, when the time came when I knew I was <clears throat> going to stop active participation, playing music or conducting music, orchestra or choir, I felt that perhaps, I, uh, since I knew quite a lot about what had been taking place over, over the years from the 1920s onwards, uh, in Singapore and there were not many people around who uh, would either have the knowledge or who would be willing to sit down and, and do this. Uh, so I used the last couple of years of my, of my work at the university uh, to be able to start on, on this work. Uh, I didn't expect it, I didn't intend it to become any kind of uh, a formal history of music, because then it, it it would not become read by many people. I I would have I felt it would be better to have it as, as a sort of uh, anecdotal account of what took place uh, in, from the 1920s onwards, uh, which it which it really was, uh, coupled with not only uh, my own involvement, but also whatever I knew that had taken place. Looking forward to the future, perhaps I would say uh, Singapore, has come, Singapore has come a long way. Uh, looking at what, what is taking place now, uh, this, this virtual, <laughs> a virtual arts explosion, the explosion of the arts, not only in music and dance and, and, and in, the, in the visual arts and photography and painting and so on. Tremendous what's happening. Every week is packed with packed with concerts, and concerts of very high order. And now with the concerts at the Esplanade, at the University Cultural Center and other places, uh, tremendous things are happening. But I have one, I still have one uh, regret, uh, and that is I, I don't think we have still got the stage where we can call ourselves a singing nation. Uh, I do hope that all these professional musicians, all these professional orchestras and others will not snuff out amateur activity. Uh, we should become like other large countries, like, like countries like uh, England and Australia and, and, and Europe and various European countries where they have professional orchestras, but at the same time they have many amateur groups, many amateur orchestras and choirs that perform almost to professional standards and it's only then that the level of uh, culture uh, within, within the society will, will rise. I hope we will get to that stage.